Turn to the Gospel of John, if you would, please. Uh, John chapter 18. Uh, we will refresh ourselves a little bit. Let's, um, let's read all, oh, let's see, first... Um, We'll read down to verse, oh man, I don't want to read all that before we have prayer. Let's just start reading and then we'll have prayer. John chapter 18, verse 1, when Jesus had spoken these words, remember this was the, his high priestly prayer that he's praying for all of his disciples. He's praying for the church. He's praying for you and I. Um, and I believe that. I believe that Jesus knew us when he died on the cross. He's, remember, he's all God. And so I believe that when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Cedron, which is Kidron in the Old Testament, where was a garden into the which he entered and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oftentimes resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither, uh, with lanterns and torches and weapons. Now, think about this for a minute, just as you ponder what you're reading. How many people did they come or they send with Judas? Quite a few. How many did they need? None. All Judas had to say was, give him the kiss, uh, Jesus, they want you in the temple, you're under arrest. Jesus would have went. He would have voluntarily went. He didn't pick a fight. In fact, when Peter uh, got excited and he was high strung too, Peter uh, lashed out against Malchus, who was the high priest's servant, and cut his ear off. Peter was ready to go to war. It reminds me of, and don't get me wrong, I am all about Second Amendment and keeping our rights. Uh, the government doesn't give us rights to carry gun. The government guarantees we will maintain those rights. Those rights are given to us by God. I bought a hat. I bought John one. I bought a hat. that uh, uh, had Second Amendment written on the back. And on the front of it, it says, Free men don't need permission. Amen. And so, uh, but, I see all these people preparing for what they think is a war that's going to happen. Now, I don't know what's going to happen. But I can tell you that God is telling us to not use the weapons of carnal warfare. We are wrestling against principalities. Listen, when, whenever something starts up, I guarantee you the devil's going to be behind it. And uh, so they didn't actually need all these weapons and men and armies, people and everything like that, that to, to arrest Jesus. There was no riot, nothing like that. And whatever Peter started, Jesus quickly stopped. He even healed the ear and put it back on. And uh, I always like to think in my mind that Jesus screwed it back on. That's just what I have in my mind. But anyway, um, have your weapons ready. Okay. I bought ammo from Brother Reg Kelly and I still got it. I take it every now and then. Somebody comes to the house. I take it out and we shoot it up and have a good time with it. But I just think that the next war that is fought is going to be a spiritual one. Um, so verse 4, Jesus, therefore knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. Jesus did not deny who he was. He did not say to them, I don't need a license. I'm not driving. I'm traveling. That's your sovereign citizens. If anybody was a sovereign, it would be Christ. But he put himself under the authority of Pontius Pilate, of Herod. He did it uh, deliberately. He did it knowingly and willingly. And uh, there just wasn't any kind of fight or argument like that. 
if you don't know what I'm talking about, um, look up Sovereign Citizens online. Look them up on YouTube. Don't believe it. Don't fall for this lie that says that the government doesn't have any real authority over you. They do, and God put them there. And if you don't believe that, you don't believe the Bible. And um, these, some of these guys are just downright dangerous. And usually when a cop pulls somebody over and finds out that they're a sovereign citizen, they immediately call for backup because they know that there's probably going to be some resistance, if, if not worse. Uh, one cop was shot dead by a man and his son who were sovereign citizens. I think it was in South Carolina. He pulled them over, and those men were so amped up on their sovereign citizen doctrine that they felt like they had permission to kill that police officer because he was trying to take them into custody or trying to pull them over to write them a ticket. And they believed that anybody who would deliberately come and quote unquote take their freedoms away was an enemy. And they just, they didn't, they didn't talk to the guy. They just pulled guns out and shot him dead with his camera rolling. And so some of those guys can be dangerous. And I'm just telling you, don't fall for it. Um, I will say this, and I have the proof to say it. Um, I've never really come out and said this before, but Kent Hovind is a sovereign citizen and has been. It's not just a recent thing. He did, uh, he made a series of videos uh, years ago, um, something about uh, how to, um, uh, how to delete your straw man or something like that. But he is clearly on the video with another man telling everybody that the laws of the United States do not apply to him, do not apply to them, that they are sovereign, that they, ha they made no contract with the government to be under their authority, so therefore they're not under their authority. And um, if you just ask me point blank I, at what, what I think about Ken Hoven, I will tell you, be careful, he's dangerous. I think his doctrines, some of his doctrines are dangerous. And um, truly his lifestyle since he got out of prison, he's been married four times just since he got out of prison. Yeah. And um, has been jailed and tried and convicted with at least one of those wives for spousal abuse. So I know I'm probably going to get hate mail on that one. Um, but I'm just telling you, watch out for people and their crazy doctrines. Okay. That includes me. Two, watch out for me. Um, verse seven, they asked him again, whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled, which he spake of them, which thou gavest me, have I lost none. We'll stop there because I have that in my notes. Father, we ask your blessings upon this service tonight and upon the teaching of your word. Lord, I pray dear God that you would guide my lips uh, as they speak, and Father, I don't want to mislead anybody. I don't want to cast a negative light upon somebody, Lord, that is not deserving of it. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would just open up our eyes and our ears to your scriptures and help us, dear God, to put the Bible first and foremost in everything that we do and let the Bible guide our activities, guide our mind, guide our words. Let the word of God be preeminent in everything that we do. You told us not to take your name in vain, and yet then you say that you have magnified your word even above your name. So, Father, help us, dear God, to not take your word in vain either. Help us, Father, to uh, realize that it is the key uh, to all happiness, all success. It is the key to salvation. It is the words of eternal life given to us, handed down through the centuries, perfect and intact, this book is. We pray, dear God, that you would bless it, bless it in our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name, and amen. Now, um, I had that up on the screen, uh, then asked he them again, whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he, if therefore you seek me, let these go their way. And verse 9 says that, that the saying might be fulfilled, 
which he spake of them which thou gavest me, have I lost none. Now, he just said that back in John chapter 17. So he's, he's fulfilling what his prophecy was. And I'm just going to ask you tonight, just if you can think of, uh, if you know and can think of any Old Testament prophecy concerning Jesus that you know came to pass during the time that Jesus was on this earth. Give me a, a, a prophecy that Jesus fulfilled. He would be numbered with the transgressors. Interesting that you picked that one out because that is one of the verses missing out of the modern Bibles. Is what it mentions that he had, he had a, a thief on the right and a thief on the left and uh, that he was there with them. The King James says that uh, this was fulfilled, the prophecy which said he is numbered with the transgressors. But that verse has been omitted out of the modern Bibles. Okay? Uh, I have, I have uh, one of our, what's well, my niece, she's working on a project I have for her. I got her uh, this 1973 NIV Bible. And I'm having her go through and find the verses. She's comparing them with what uh, is on Blue Letter Bible. Uh, the, current, um, the current NIV Bible is on there. And she's comparing the 1973 verses with the 2020 verses. Because I know that they are different. So if you, and here's the thing. If you memorized Bible verses from an NIV years ago, they're not valid anymore. They've changed the Bible verses. If we, uh, we used to do this, we had Bible drills and whatever, and we would give out verses for kids that had memorized the verses to say them, and we'd hear what they said and, and measure it up against what was written down. And if what they said was written down and they got it right, then they got points or whatever. You can't do that anymore. You cannot ask kids to, to uh, memorize verses of Scripture and then have some sort of contest among the kids, some sort of game, friendly game, where they're quoting the verses because what Bible then are you going to use? And this was an issue down with uh, some friends of ours um, some, some fellow churches down in Northwest Arkansas, their, um, their district was, uh, in a battle over what Bible was going to be used for all of their Bible bowl games and everything like that. And a lot of the preachers had gone to the English standard version and you had a lot of the preachers that were still with the King James and you had a lot of the King James preachers thinking that their friends preachers would stick with the King James, and when the vote came out, they found out that their friends jumped ship on them. And so they were very, very disappointed at what had happened. And um, so anyway, I hated that, that, it, that it turned out that way, but I kind of suspected that it would. So anyway, that, that place is missing. Give me another one. Yes. And... Okay, there's a couple more in there, if you can find them. Number one, Psalm 22, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? They part my garment and cast lots for my vesture. What else? They laugh me to scorn. Anything else? Okay. All right, Psalm 22. Who else? A prophecy that Jesus fulfilled in his life. Liam? Oh, you don't have your hand raised. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yes. By his stripes we are healed. Isaiah, what? Isaiah 53, there you go, Isaiah 53, you got it. Okay, never mind. All right, we did this before the harmony of the four Gospels. We showed that in each Gospel, 
They give a little bit different rendering of this story, but if you add them all together, you get the complete story of what happened to Malchus' ear. Peter cut it off. Uh, Jesus put it back on, healed it. If I was Malchus, I'd be like, oh, I'm following this guy. I'm following Jesus. Nobody has ever, ever screwed my ear back on and it worked. It's never happened before. All right, and then Mark chapter uh, 14. Um, well, this, this is going along with the harmony of the gospel, so I'm going to move on from that. Uh, and here's the rendering over Jesus' head in all four of the gospels. In Matthew, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. In Mark, it just simply says the king of the Jews. In Luke, it says this is the king of the Jews. And then in John, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. And when you put them all together... That says, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. You get the entire, what's it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten words. You get the entire message that was written over the cross. Okay? Uh, some scholars and theologians like to point out and say, well, obviously, uh, these people got it wrong. They didn't write down the right words. And so there's errors in the, in the manuscripts. And that's a lie. You don't have to, you don't have to fall for that. Now, this cup that uh, Jesus is referring to. Let's, we started on that last Wednesday. Let's get into it a little bit further. In John chapter 18, verse 11, then said Jesus unto Peter, put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? So what cup was he referring to? Psalm 116, 13, I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Uh, I mentioned to you, I think last week or week before, uh, that uh, in the occult and with the Da Vinci Code, there was a, a big noise made about the so-called chalice that Jesus allegedly drank out of at the Last Supper, but we know that Jesus didn't drink at the Last Supper. He would not partake of the wine. And so there is no cup that Jesus drank of at the Last Supper. It doesn't exist. But they say it does. That Indiana Jones found it and drank it, right? Okay? Um, and gave it to his dad who was dying of a, of a bullet wound and poured it on the bullet wound and on and on and on. That's all, believe it or not, there are people who believe that and they're searching for what they believe is the Holy Grail. The real cup so, so, and then there's the other one. The Joseph of Arimathea is supposed to have had the cup that Jesus used at the Last Supper. And when he saw the blood coming down from the cross, he, he collected the, the blood of Christ in that cup and then carried it off and hid it away in, um, somewhere in England. And the story is that he threw the cup and the blood down into a well so that nobody could get to it and so on. But even that is make believe. And so let's say that, let's say that, um, next year, two years from now, um, the archaeologists come out with a press conference and they say they had this cup here and they say this, we know for a fact is the cup that Jesus drank from at the Last Supper. This cup contains his blood and, uh, we believe that this blood has unique properties. And it looks like to us that this blood will be able to cure all diseases and it will allow people to live forever. Don't fall for it. If you are lost, that's not the cup you want to drink from. If you're saved, you already drank from it. It's the cup of salvation. And how did you drink of it? Here at communion service? No. You drank from it the day that you asked Jesus into your heart. And in that cup, not only is eternal life granted to you, see, it's not your flesh that drinks it. It's your soul. And how does your soul take in something? You read it. How is it that we eat the bread of God? We read it. We feed our soul with it. 
And so you've already taken that cup. There is another cup. And I'll show you that in a minute. Their sorrows shall be multiplied that hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood will I not offer nor take up their names into my lips. The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup thou maintainest my lot. Isaiah 51, awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, which has drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. That is more than likely the cup that the world is going to pre be presented with in some form. I don't exactly know how it's going to happen. But I do believe that everybody in the world is going to have the opportunity to partake of something physically. And they're going to be told that in doing that, it will guarantee them immortality, that they will live forever. Now, you probably already know this, but it's not good that some people should live forever. Amen? Some people just need to die but when a lost wicked man becomes an immortal what kind of God is he going to be a good one or an evil one um, and so in Isaiah 51 21 therefore hear now this thou afflicted and drunken but not with wine what would they be drunken with turn to uh, Let's see if I have it in my notes here. No. Revelation 17. What would they be drunk with? Uh, no. But you're in the right chapter. Um, verse 4. Having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication okay so it's a cup of filthiness a cup of fornication and it makes people drunk okay um, verse 17 here Jeremiah 25 then I took the, then took I the cup at the Lord's hand and made all the nations to drink unto whom the Lord had sent me to wit Jerusalem and the cities of Judah and the kings thereof um, I'm not gonna say a lot about this uh, one of our watchers um, has a disagreement with me, and I appreciated the way he presented his disagreement. Um, it had to do with things that I said about certain political leaders, high-ranking political figures in this country, that I believe, I believe primarily that they're devil worshipers. Um, we know we know for a fact that men like Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan, uh, George Bush, Papa Bush, were all at a place in California called Bohemian Grove. We know it for a fact. And we know that there is a very evil ritual that takes place there. Whether they sacrifice a real human or they just sacrifice in effigy, which means like a dummy, they are still involved in a pagan ritual that exalts this great big giant statue of an owl. What does the Bible say about owls? They're evil spirits. And so these high-ranking political figures, bare minimum going to that, that's evil enough. I don't need anything else to say, uh, that ain't right. But it tells me that because they were all there and everybody knows everybody else that's there, none of them is going to speak out against it and none of them is going to go against any kind of plan from people who have more power than even presidents have power. They're going to go along with it. Why? Because if word got out that they were involved in some kind of ritual, or involved in some kind of 
practice of evil. It would ruin them. It would destroy their political career. It would destroy uh, everything about them. And so, uh, right, they, this, this person who disagreed with me, and, and again, I didn't have a problem with what he said and what he disagreed with. But I would look at verse 18 here, to wit, Jerusalem and the cities of Judah and the kings thereof. The kings and the princes are the reason why God is going to make that a desolation. It's because of their evil. It's because they're the ones, if you go back to Revelation 17, she's made the kings, verse 2, with whom the kings of the earth had committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So it's not just political leaders, it's everybody in the earth, but it is the kings of the earth, the people who are in charge, people who are in high office, who I can't tell you specifically on what date and what place they were in and what all they did. I have enough in the scriptures that tells me that the higher up you go, in the political scene in this world, I almost guarantee you, you've been involved in some wicked ritual. So, uh, I may be wrong on some of the particulars that I mentioned, but right here I'm looking at plain scripture that's telling me that kings of the earth and princes of the earth have been made drunk with her wine. And so, so on. Um, turn to Matthew 20. We didn't, we haven't got this far yet. Turn to Matthew 20. Here we have a woman. The mother of Zebedee's children. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, uh, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. Now, I want you to think about this mother, okay? Um, what she's asking Jesus is she's asking Jesus, in essence, for Political, religious favoritism. There's supposed to be a, a law in this country, in certain realms, against what's called nepotism. What is nepotism? Right. Or let's say you get elected president and every member of your cabinet is somebody in your family. Okay, you put all your sons in there, all your daughters or your granddaughters in high office. And so basically this one family is ruling. I mean, think and there are political families in this country, the Kennedys, the Bushes, the Clintons, um, the Bidens. These are very powerful people. And we wonder why they keep getting away with the things they get away with. It's because they're powerful. And in the case of some of them, you go against them and go against their family, all of a sudden, you'll be out committing suicide with a bullet to the back of your head. Okay? And so that kind of stuff happens. It happens in small counties. This, I, listen, there, there are probably counties in this country that are ruled over by some sheriff, some boss sheriff, and he's got his sons and his daughters in uh, very preeminent places so that he has total control of what goes on in that. I, I always thought, you know, why doesn't somebody in the CIA go over and kill Kim Jong-un of North Korea? You ever wondered that? Why don't somebody just go and shoot that guy? Because he's evil, right? 
He's evil. He's forcing his own people into poverty. He steals all the money. Why don't somebody kill him? That wouldn't work. Because the Kim family is a dynasty in North Korea. You'd have to kill every member of the Kim family. Then you would have to kill all the high-ranking political advisors, generals, and so on. You'd have to do away with probably a thousand people. Because that's how deep the power base runs. And that's how it is in places in this earth, and I guarantee you in this country. Now watch this. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him, desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? And she saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons, my two sons, may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. What does she want? So I tell me what she really wants. Special treatment for who? Her kids. She wants the world to see her two sons sitting right next to Jesus Christ when he comes into his kingdom so that she can go, oh, I'm so proud of my boys. Those are my boys. I raised them right. We homeschooled them. Yeah. We ate vegan and we didn't feed them any sugar or anything like that. So my boys are better than everybody else's boys. And Jesus let them sit by him. Okay. There are people like that. They are like that. She's wanting special favor. Favoritism. But Jesus answered and said, you know not what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I shall drink of? And to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, we are able. And he saith unto them, ye shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my father. And I mean, I can tell you, I've been in church all my life. I have seen families who are powerful, usually led by a Jezebel grandma, Jezebel mother, who likes to have her say in everything that goes on in the church. So she will put, I'll give you an example. Um, Brent Hutzel um, fell into a church like this. He really thought that this was going to be a good church for him. There was a man in the church who owned a bunch of pharmacies. He owned a chain of pharmacies in that area. And that man himself was a member of this church. But he wasn't on any of the committees of that church. This church was one of these, they have a committee for everything. Okay, if we need to buy paper, well, we have a paper buying committee for that. They need to vote on that. I mean, it's that, it's that way. And, uh, but he had members of his family in just about every committee in that church so that if he wanted something done, it got done. What Brent found out was this guy was using the church to launder money from his pharmacies. At the beginning of the year, he would write a check for $100,000 to the church. The church would put that in a special account. And throughout the next several months, he would take out of that account the money that he wanted. And the pastor, Brent, called um, Christian Law Association and called uh, Jay Seculo. And they both said, this guy's laundering money through the church. You need to put a stop to it or you're going to prison. Is the IRS catches them and you haven't done anything to try to stop it, you're going to prison. And so he did. He went to this guy and sat down with it. This guy, incidentally, paid for Brent's kids to go to the best Christian school in that town. 
And Brent's like, man, I'm getting treated good here. Well, there was a reason why. This guy was using his money and his influence to have his way. He was running the whole church from behind the scenes. I'll be honest with you. I don't understand people who want power like that. I just, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything for me. I don't want more authority. I want less. I want less headache. But anyway, that's what he was doing. And, and there are people like that in church. There are people like that in politics. There are people like that in civic organizations. They have got to run everything that there is. And Jesus said, well, guess what? Your boys are fixing to get hit. They're going to drink of this cup, and it's a cup of sorrows. It's a cup of trembling. And this baptism is a baptism of fire. And they are going to go through it. But to allow them to sit next to me on my right and my left, I, I don't even make that decision. That belongs to our Father. So if you can convince Him, knock yourself out. But I'm not making the decision. And um, I'm always very careful when somebody asks me to baptize their son or their daughter. I am very careful to let them know. I want to talk to them and I want to make sure they know what salvation is and what water baptism is. Because I'm not baptizing them and then you tell them for the rest of their life that they're saved and going to heaven because they were baptized in Mike Hoggard's baptistry. They were baptized, so therefore they're going to heaven. I don't want that on my conscience. But that's, there are people that are like that. Got to have their way in everything. And Jesus put her down. Matthew chapter 26. This is the cup now that Jesus said, let this cup pass from me. He said, oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep. And saith unto Peter, What, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. By the way, that's a good place to underline in your Bible. How do you avoid temptation? Watch and pray. Watch, number one, because you know the tempter is going to show up. Number two, pray that God will show you the way of escape from that temptation. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And right here we have exactly what uh, Paul was talking about in Romans 7, where he differentiates between the flesh and our soul, our spirit. Our spirit wants to serve God. It wants to be godly. It wants to do right things. Our flesh doesn't. Our flesh wants to get us in trouble. Our flesh wants to sin. Our flesh wants to turn away from God. Our flesh doesn't want to get up and go to church on Sunday. It doesn't want to go on Wednesday night. It doesn't want to go at any time. It doesn't want to pray. It doesn't want to read the Bible. That's our flesh. But our spirit is like, we need this. We need this. And so... Um, in verse 41, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And so right here you have also what happens with a lot of Christians. They lay their head down at night. They begin to pray and they fall asleep. And they wake up. God, I'm sorry. And pray and they fall asleep. And uh, I've always maintained that that's probably the best way to go to sleep anyway. Uh, don't count sheep. Count prayer requests. Um, verse 42, he went, he went away again the second time and prayed saying, Oh, my father, if this cup, this is twice now, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. And so that cup that he was referring to was Calvary, his sacrifice, his crucifixion. And so you and I, likewise, we carry a cross everywhere we go. In everything that we do, we deny ourselves, we take up our cross, and we follow Jesus. Uh, there was a, YouTube was recommended a video for me to watch. I probably should have watched it. I hope I can find it again. But it was one of these um, health and wealth preachers really saying that if you are poor, 
you are in sin. You're in rebellion against God because if you are poor, it's your fault. And then he said this. Um, you expect God to bless you with riches and, and financial blessings. And yet you go out and when you're going to go buy something, you buy the cheapest thing that you can get. You buy the one that's on sale. You buy the one that's on clearance or whatever. And he said, and I've heard this phrase used before. That's called poverty thinking. You're not thinking prosperity thinking. So he said, you go out and you buy the most expensive thing that you can buy. You buy it even if you can't pay for it because you're telling God then that you're putting your trust in him that God will send the money for that and make you rich. That's which it's called the law of attraction. Look it up. The law of attraction. The um, let's see, what was it? The secret. That video training called The Secret was the law of attraction, which is witchcraft. I can show you the quotes from witches who practice the law of attraction. They say positive things. They never say negative things. Joel Osteen will never say anything negative. And he can't, can't even do it in an Oprah interview. He says all positive things because he believes that if he says negative things, then negative thing happens. Bad things happen. And that's just pure witchcraft. And they also tell you, like, and I, I think, I, I don't know, I, there was a, a Bible that I remember somebody brought years ago, and it was a, one of these charismatic commentary Bibles. And it said in the commentary, never, ever begin your prayer with, Lord, if it be thy will, because you've just destroyed your faith-filled words. Now God cannot do what you want him to do. You boldly proclaim that this is how it's going to be and God will supply it. But that's not what Jesus did. Jesus said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. If Jesus would have proclaimed his will, he would have never got on that cross. All right. So Paul now in 1 Corinthians 11 said, For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he break it. By the way, if you're looking for a verse that supports praying before a meal, you're looking at it. Pray when you eat, which is broken for you. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Now, did he say this bread becomes my body? Did he say that? Did he say, this bread is turned into my body? Did he say that? He said, this bread is my body. So a priest that believes he can turn the bread into the, the meat, the muscle tissue, the blood of Jesus Christ, he's lying. Or he's practicing a very dark form of wizardry okay he believes that he can turn a piece of bread into flesh meat and there are there have been and i i don't know what to think about them i think it's possible that the devil conjured something like this all over the world there are shrines built to uh the um the eucharist where Literally, at some time in history, um, the priest offered up the wafer. And I know of one story, a lady in the Philippines, um, just about every time she would partake of the bread and she'd put it in her mouth, she'd open her tongue and it was a piece of flesh on her tongue. Now, there's two possibilities for that. Number one... Um, the devil really did that. That's, that's within the scope of possibility. Number two, this woman learned a trick. Magicians can do things that you would swear has to be some kind of magic mojo from, from devils, demons, okay? And the truth of it is, it's, it's all about sleight of hand, 
and you know she's probably got something wrapped up in her mouth that when he gives her the bread all of a sudden she does something and all of a sudden she's got this piece of meat on her tongue and they they take that literally and put it somewhere and pray to it praying to a piece of meat where do they find out it's bacon okay um but magicians do things like that all the time okay remember magicians can pull an endless line of handkerchiefs out of their mouth but do they really have 150 foot of handkerchief down in their gut no okay they would die but anyway so but things like that are tricks and lying signs and wonders that the devil will use to get people to believe uh, in the Catholic doctrine. But anyway, verse 24, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take heat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, the cup, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. He didn't say this cup becomes the blood. I turned it into the blood. Um, we learn from the Bible that the juice of the grape is grape's blood. So that's what he meant. This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. And remember what Jesus said, I'm the vine. You're the branches. So how literal was he referring to? He's as literal as it, as it is, I guess. Verse 27, where, wherefore... Whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. And so now watch this. What does it take for a person to be unworthy to partake of the Lord's Supper? What does it take to be unworthy of it? Huh? Okay, sins. Sins universally make everybody unworthy correct okay so because the doctrine is the doctrine that we're fighting against is that you eating this wafer this makes you saved this makes you worthy but paul says that your worthiness should be in place before you eat this. Does that make sense to everybody? So can the, can the Eucharist, the wafer, the, the piece of meat, the bacon, can that, when it hits somebody's tongue, can it make them worthy? No, they're supposed to already be worthy. And like you said, the, the way to be worthy is to have your sins forgiven. Now you are worthy to partake of it. It doesn't make it. There is nothing in this world that if you partake of it, makes you saved. Nothing. There's nothing that you eat, nothing you drink, no church that you visit, no ritual that you perform that makes you saved or unsaved. It is the work of Jesus Christ done for you. You just accept it and believe it. So he says, verse 28, let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And I just, you know, I, I think of, uh, you know, like organized crime mafia guys. They've always got somebody in the family that's a priest, somebody who can wave the magic wand and get get them off of all their sins so that they're a saint now in heaven and uh they they partake of the lord's supper when well, they take partake of the eucharist and god said through paul if you eat and drink that thing you're bringing damnation you are eating and drinking damnation to yourself um i want to get to where is it? I probably don't even have it in here. Let me let me look that up. Get ready to turn your Bible somewhere. There is a 
cup. Come on, load her up. There is a cup of devils. Ah. First Corinthians ten twenty one. Turn there. Paul was talking about meat sacrifice to idols. We have the Jerusalem Council's uh, commandments to us Gentiles that we're not to eat anything strangled or anything that is hung to death, hung on a tree or whatever. We're not to eat anything sacrificed to idols. If we are aware of it, we certainly shouldn't do it. If we eat unaware of it, there is no harm done because we know that an idol is nothing. Paul said this. But to deliberately, um, and I was, uh, Paige was telling how she went to a family member's wedding and it was a Catholic wedding and so uh, the priest had everybody uh, standing and sitting and standing and sitting and then kneeling. Uh, if, you've ever, if you've never been to a Catholic church, they have these little kneeling benches that, that slide out. They kind of roll out like this and the faithful Catholics will get down on their knees and pray. They're told to do that. My dad went to the uh, funeral of a, of a man that he worked with on the, uh, the river boat. And the guy fell in the river and drowned. And dad went to his funeral. was at a Catholic church. And dad said that he looks around and he sees everybody all of a sudden get down on their knees and kneeling on that bench. And he had his feet propped up on it. He thought it was a, a foot prop. Yeah. You know. Way to go, dad. But um, she said that the priest... Uh, he had a sign that he said, if you want to uh, partake of this bread or whatever, do your arms like this or something like that. And I said, you didn't eat it, did you? She said, no way I'm not eating that. I said, good girl. Good girl, way to go. Uh, don't eat it. It is, it is meat sacrificed unto idols. They, they crucify the Son of God afresh and bring him to an open shame. They, they supposedly sacrifice this Eucharist right in front of the statue of Jesus, the statue of Joseph, and the statue of Mary. Which is where they get the saying, Jesus, Joseph, and Mary. Um, because those are always present in the Catholic Church. And um, so don't do that. Don't eat that. That we are commanded not to do that. And then not to drink or eat anything with the blood in it. Um, those are abominations. God, God sent word through the apostles and disciples for us not to do that. So he, Paul says, verse 20, But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Amen. You see, when we partake of the Lord's Supper here, we are fellowshipping with Jesus Christ in that act. We're joining with him. We are saying to our Lord, we know that this cup, we know that this bread is the bread of sacrifice. We know that it brings sorrow. We know that there is, um, you know, there's suffering that went along with it, that your body was broken. We are joining with you that if need be, we offer ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God. And so he says in verse 21, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Think about it. There is a cup of devils. There is a table of devils. I believe 
there is something that mankind is going to be a partaker of, a literal, physical partaking of it. We have so many things in the Bible that point in that direction. Moses taking the, the uh, sacrifice, the, the calf that they uh, worshipped, and breaking it into, grind it into powder and put it in the water so that they ingested it. They drank their God. Which is what the Catholics do when they go to church. What the Lutherans do when they go to their church. They are, they are eating and drinking their God. And they believe that in doing that, they have God in them, giving them a divine nature. And I think that that is all pointing towards something that's going to come one of these days. And mankind is going to partake of it. It's not going to be forced on him. No way, no how. Man's going to want this. And they're going to do it. And in doing that, they're going to bring about their own damnation. All right. I'll end with the word damnation.